to come into an organization and be bold enough to say, listen, you know, effectively the executive and ultimately the CEO, this is what I need to do to make this work. And it includes things like merging teams. All right. So Andrew from Commonwealth Super, um, tell me a bit about how you plan out your digital transformation journeys um, from getting board buy-in. Let's start there. Sure. I think, you know, um, these days, yeah, you need to look at sort of uh, publications like the Australian Institute, a couple of company directors and other uh, publications like that to see that uh, boards these days are being inundated with tech buzzwords and new things and stuff that they should have or stuff that they should fix or stuff they should do. And I think it all becomes a bit blurry to me. And of course, you know, I always have a bit of a joke with my board to say, I bet you today you're going to talk about this because it was in last week's AICD, last month's AICD magazine, right? And <laughs> funnily enough, a lot of times it actually is what they bring up, right? Um, because they obviously try and stay with trends and try and understand what's happening there. But I think fundamentally when you talk about these transformation programs, you have to really peel that back and say, what does the organisation actually need? And when I say that, um, it is all about not putting lipstick on the pig. It's one of my phrases I use a lot. It's, you know, it's old, it's cliched, but I've just seen it so many times. And the example I always use is, you know, we all have mobile banking applications these days and they're beautiful and schmick and do wonderful things. But if you swipe that transaction and it said, yeah, I'll, I'll do that transaction in three days, which is the world we lived in 10 years ago, you would say this application's rubbish, right? <laughs> uh, even though it was beautiful and schmick and as good as it is today with all the sort of richness, because they hadn't dealt with the pig, which is the back-end transactional systems. So I think taking organisations on that journey is really important and you have to really get that mindset to say you don't want to divert your energy and your prioritisation, your funding and your efforts into things that are just lipstick because fundamentally you won't get the outcome for your customers. What they'll get is something that looks pretty but doesn't do the job and no one wants that. So that education process is where you need to go. You need to really understand... Once you've got that board environment, it then drops down to the next layer, which is, you know, Exco, and your CEO. Does the CEO really buy into this? Is the CEO just being driven by sales targets or, you know, getting more customers or getting you know, growth or any of those things that you want to do? You know, EBITDA, all those other things that happen, right? Now, fortunately, I'm in a super fund. We talk about, re we talk about returns on investment, not EBITDA, so it's a little bit different. But we certainly have parameters that we have to work with in with regard to costs and efficiencies. So I think once you've got the actual... Uh, buy in there uh, from the CEO, you then also got your executive and you've got to get your executive on board. And I can guarantee you won't have your old executive on board. So you've got to find mechanism to capture a governance model that almost gives them a view that says, gee, if I'm not going to be the person that stands up and says, I think this shouldn't be prioritised, I might look slightly awkward because it absolutely makes sense that we should be. <laughs> you know, I don't want to be that odd person out, right? So I think that's the other thing. And then the next part that layers to that is to understand what is the organisation, what is the pace of the organisation. So, for example, you know, I've come from sort of uh, West Farmers background. You know, I've been in vir Virgin Velocity Frequent Flyer, sort of high pace, high volume transaction, all those sorts of things, less regulation, less compliance, to sort of superannuation, which is highly regulated, lots of compliance, cyber security is a must, all those sorts of things. So you have to start to read about what's the ability for your organisation to be able to execute at what speed? What is that speed that the organisation can run with? And I think that's something that people have trouble digesting. So, you know, when I set up our transformation program, I brought in some highly capable people to compliment people who have been there for a long time and didn't know what good looked like. Mm -hmm. But I had to adjust those people for it's not a race, <laughs> right? It's an execution delivery journey and there's a pace that's set that's got to align to what the organisation can cater for. And then if you take that sort of thing, the next part is how bold are you prepared to be? And I find that this is straight leadership. This is not about being a CIA. This is not about being a technologist or plugging in cables or buying, buying a new metal box. It's have you got strong leadership? And the strong leadership is to be bold. You know? So, for example, I went to an organisation that had transformation that sat in as a project in one corner with a massive team and a massive spend and a technology department on the other. And the technology department sat under finance and the transformation programs reported through an executive to the CEO. But somehow these were meant to come together and actually get the outcome that they wanted to achieve, for example. You know? We also had no prioritisation in the business. You know, everyone was, you know, had the right work ethic, we're working hard, we're doing things. But are we doing the right things? Are we doing the things that we all agree are going to get the outcomes that we want? Again, that lack of prioritisation. So to come into an organisation and be bold enough to say, listen, you know, effectively the executive and ultimately the CEO, 
this is what I need to do to make this work, and it includes things like merging teams, you know, potentially having someone who was a direct report to the CEO report to someone who's now a CIO and head of transformation, move that reporting line to be a direct to the CEO, create a whole EP, you know, enterprise project management office that used to sit as a financial project office and recreate that into something that does proper delivery and prioritisation is something that's been driven over a journey now of multiple years. And uh, I think for the first time in my career, when you take that bold approach of either we do it this way or really I, ha I haven't bought in. And if I haven't bought in, then I shouldn't be here. Mm. Um, and to go to that level, which I think a lot of people obviously are quite shy about because they, you know, that might be the first time they're in a CIO role or they you know, want to have longevity in the organisation or they play the politics or all those things. The difference between talking about it and delivering is kind of the gap. And if they don't do that, then they're trying to cater for everyone's political need and actually that then dilutes the outcome that you're trying to achieve. And it sounds like from what you're saying as well, for example, you can reskin an app, but it doesn't fix the back end payment system. And this prioritization of the order in which things need to be done <laughs> is different to the expectations of the organization. So they might say, we need to uplift customer experience. And that might not mean necessarily just looking at the UX of it, mm -hmm. but all the underlying infrastructure, including the legacy that's inhibiting on achieving those experiences. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, we've had classic, you know, through transformation, I've experienced this where we've been going to build a solution in a schedule that says, you know, next time we're going to build a electronic digital form solution. And, you know, the business will say, oh, but we have a prioritisation, we need this now and it's really simple and oh, we can do this and just give us the buy-in and, you know, we can get this done as a tactical solution until we get the strategic solution in place. And, you know, I got to a point where, you know, I made a decision to say, okay, let's see if we can make the tactical solution work to, you know, accommodate the business need. Well, some 18 months later, because it wasn't quite as simple as what they originally thought, which I kind of thought might happen, but again, until you know, you don't know, um, we get to the other end and actually the production strategic solution was put into place before the tactical solution was. And we ended up going straight to production and so, you know, there's some regret to spend there in what we did. Uh, having said that, there was a lot of learnings. There was a lot of learnings in creating the specification that was required that made the production end state strategic goal easy. So it wasn't a waste of money, but it certainly, there was some duplicated effort, but it was certainly a learning and uh, you know, a learning along the way. Mm. And one of the things that we're hearing on that, particularly in financial services, is moving from a project to a product mindset. Yeah. Because projects have these defined areas of um, this is how much we spend, this is the life cycle. Yeah. Um, Product is an ongoing, continuous iteration. Are, are you seeing that evolution happen in your organisation too? Oh, it certainly is. I think one of the things that's a challenge is in superannuation, it's reasonably static. So product is not something you're reinventing every week. It's trying. It's something you try and enhance or try and provide more value to or making it simpler to understand or simpler to access. But once again, it's in a sea of regulation and compliance to make sure that you actually provide the outcomes that you promise. So it's not not an easy environment. But I think... You know, once again, everything that we're doing is still ultimately to say when we get to the initial phase of transformation delivery, we can start doing the lipstick because there isn't a pig anymore, right? <laughs> and, and we start getting that that application or that you know that that uh, portal that's much better, all those sorts of other things. So, for example, we used to be in a world of um, if if you logged into our uh, our portal as a member. Um, the first thing it did when you hit the login button was it said, instead of using name and password, it said, which scheme are you in? And we had a whole list of schemes depending which government department you were and all these other things. So the first problem was a lot of people didn't even know what scheme they were, they were in. Mm -hmm. Then people would say, well, what if I've got more than one because I've been different down the departments? Can I get the aggregated view of my super? Well, no, you have to go into multiple portals to do that. So just in this you know, transformation journey, we've now taken that step forward to say, people can now actually log in. They actually need to know the username and password, not what scheme they're in, and they get an aggregated view of all their superannuation you know, accounts, funds, how they're tracking and all those other things. So, yeah, it's an interesting area because superannuation is not sticky. It's not something where you want to go and open the app every single day and, you know, it's not transactional like a banking app. You know, we're in financial services, but a lot of people that wait till they're, you know, 45, 50 and go, oh, maybe I should look at my super, how much is in there, you know, am I on the right, right path for retirement, those sorts of things. So, yeah, it's a very different environment to typical financial services. But there's no doubt um, that there is something to be said around still having that uh, pro product focus with the end user in mind and make sure our members have delightful outcomes. But I think we've got to do that within some guardrails of what does make sense from a spend point of view, 
you know, we have fairly uh, robust conversations of do you need an app, do you not need an app? Uh, you know, there's definitely benefits in having an app, but there's also a cost and maintenance that goes with it. Is that much better than the portal as far as what it provides? Well, probably not. Will we do one? Probably yes. When? I don't know. But it'll be when we're in the life cycle of our transformation at the end point where we have done that foundational work, we're comfortable that what we've got is robust. And when we start producing things like that, people go, wow, this is a delightful experience, a bit like the NetBank app that I mentioned earlier, um, that it does do things you know, in real time or on the fly or it's meaningful or it's you know, something that gives them a bit of joy. Yeah. Um, how important are you finding things like real-time insights at the moment to um, deliver on experiences? Because like you said, people don't want to yeah. um, have it all the time, but I'm sure mm. your employees do want real-time insights. They do. I mean, all, all our areas all around uh, employee education, around you know what do we provide that others don't. We're a little bit boutique with where we sit. So I think there is, there is a bit of that. But once again, I go back to we are a fairly static sort of portfolio with regard to what we offer. So... Um, we don't have to be leading edge, but we definitely do use um, some of the real-time information as far as, you know, we know the time that, that when people sort of advise us they're looking to switch funds and things like that. Is there an opportunity to try and slow them back? You know, do we use the people who are very switched as an opportunity to bring them back again? Um, we are a closed closed offer fund, so you, no one, you know, not just anyone can sign up. You have to have been in the Defence Force or in work mm -hmm. for public service. So, But, you know, our opportunity is, you know, in our retention strategy, can we use that data to then craft what's happened in that period that's made them look at, you know, going elsewhere and can we actually know that to bring it back. But I think you know, also the real-time leaks for us is, is more around what was happening as far as, uh, you know, PDF forms and call centre calls, you know, a very different type of data, which is how many calls were we getting with people who were struggling to fill out, you know, a PDF form because the logic in it is difficult to navigate. It's one of those typical ones where it says, you know, if you answered yes to B, 3B, go to 7D and all those sorts of things and, of course, as a naive person that doesn't understand some of the terms on the form, that can be really difficult, it can be frustrating, it results in calls to our call centre. So even just moving our old PDF forms to an electronic form with the logic inside of it that guides you through that process, that if you tick that, it takes you to this, has cut down our, our call volume on our call centre just by doing that. Right? So very different type of data analytics, but also, you know, we're also working towards, you know, very advanced analytics around our customer retention and acquisition strategies and building those insightful dashboards that gives us that view that does allow us to act upon what's happening. Yeah, look, uh, churn is an exceptional metric to build something like a machine learning model on to understand where customers drop off or when you lose a particular customer, but you need a certain data maturity in place to be able to start to use some of these strategies. What's the journey been like with building data maturity? I think um, when you're in, you know, we're a 100 year, year old plus organisation so there is no doubt, I think we've got 22 plus schemes, uh, there is no doubt we are not clean as a whistle when it comes to data. Uh, yeah, we've got a lot of le legacy. I think, you know, what we've done is we've done a really good job of prioritising, um, you know, that information that's important to us. I think we've done a good job of, you know, our data cataloguing and making sure we're building something that is common. Um, I think our big journey, our big benefit for analytics platform was less around what we were getting out of it, but more what we put into it because when we had to put information into it is where we had to build really a design around how do we start bringing our data into a common format, common language, common standard, standard mapping, that we can then use that information to actually then drive other things that are happening as we move forward. And so now we're at another end of our, you know, the other end of our transformation, we're actually starting to migrate our actual schemes uh, to a new administration platform for super, which is a bit like you know, doing an ERP system or any of those sorts of things. Uh, obviously, it's a very different platform, but you know, it's our core transaction system. That's the part we're doing now, which is the consolidation of multiple platforms into one. Mm. And uh, you know, that, that will be where we, again, take the learnings from what we've done in the analytics platform and can apply it to how we do this migration. And all these things are very iterative. We're always finding things that are a bit of a, oh, that's a gotcha, that's different, that's not quite what we thought. But overall... I, you know, I, I don't think we're anywhere near perfect, but I don't feel like it's been that difficult that we haven't found the right people. You know, our greatest benefit is retention. We've got some incredible subject matter experts in our organisation. In fact, we've got a great culture, we've got great people um, that lean into this, and that's allowed us to actually really be able to navigate those challenges. Uh, and I think I've seen that in many organisations in my sort of career where some of those SMEs leave and no one does know, you know, what that data field means or why it was used that way or how to interpret it and there is no documentation or, you know, in some cases the person's retired or maybe even passed away. And I've actually been in that situation, you know, yeah. or where 
trying to pay people to keep working in a role even though they wanted to retire 10 years ago because there's no one else to, to fill the role because that technology is obsolete. So, you know, I think we're very fortunate with where we are in our journey, even though we're on legacy systems, that we do have that sweet spot of being able to transition to something better for the future. Cool. Um, and when you think about your role, how, how does it look different in 10 years' time? I think uh, in 10 years' time, it will be less around operations and coding and dealing with hardcore engineering yeah, uh, and, and more around value-add. I think, you know, we've already seen that in the CIO community and the general tech and digital community overall that our roles are changing. You know, we keep saying customer-focused, customer outcome, but it really is heading there. Mm. Uh, you know, we're seeing with the event of AI where we can take things that are monotonous tasks and we can start to automate them through using AI and at the end of the day, it's back to machine learning. It's a bit of back to the future. I mean, you know, when you take all these new AI engines that are out there, fundamentally they're scraping information off the web, you know, and using other sources of information to build that intelligence. They didn't just come up with it. So I think, you know, the, the idea of not having to code, you know, is something that's real. I think, you know, we'll get people that do quality assurance that the function matches the required outcome rather than starting and writing code. You know, I think when you go into health, you get all this, this sort of the, the imagery that you can start using based on, AI real events and facts rather than a person's interpretation of a screenshot. You know, you look at every experience, every touch point that we have, I think these roles will turn very much into what can we plug into something that exists as a known quantity rather than trying to work out what that known quantity is, which mm. is a whole different methodology and thinking, which really does force the whole tech industry and certainly CIO leaders to really change their lens in their mind. And you, you're forced into thinking business. It's not about you know, the, the metal in the in the comms room and the cable that connects it and, the, you know, the, the gigabit back, back plane or the new AWS instance and, you know, all those things. I mean, they'll all be there to a degree because obviously it's core infrastructure that supports what we're doing. But I think even that, you know, I think the next move, you know, in cloud is how many people are going to stop just moving boxes from their data centres and putting them in the cloud and start actually saying, how do I get that service as a service so I don't have engineers that have to manage that in the cloud? Yeah. I want to go to a vendor, you know. Why do I go to, a, to Salesforce? Because I don't want to manage a CRM environment, right? I just want to use the CRM environment, right? Yeah. And they're bloody good at it, and so they should be, right? That's what the, their, their bread and butter is. So I think that doing that is really part of that leverage model. And I think getting through those journeys, as I've learned, is you know, using integrators to work with del delivering those big platforms is another key thing. Uh, you buy those big platforms, there's the, the marketing, there's the, the volume of, of market that they uh, uh, share as far as, you know, they're, they're the number one, but how do you actually get it implemented with the smarts that you need? Mm. And using integrators to say, how do I buy that capability that can show me what best, what good looks like or the best looks like? How we don't just pick up things that we do badly and recreate them in new environments to, to, on new technology. You know, bridging that gap is all about changing that, which ultimately, again, comes back to better customer exper experience.